Hi, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, players and coaches. Uh, my name's Coach Lee, for those that don't know me or don't recognise me. Uh, today, we have been amazingly greeted with the presence of uh, Matt Hocking, ex-professional soccer player in England. Very successful player. Um, he is now a professional coach on the West Coast. He is working with a club called Marietta Surf. He is the uh, DOC there and he also coaches uh, or did coach a couple of the former DA teams that are now MLS teams. So uh, Matt, I'm thrilled that you're with us. Um, I've had the pleasure of playing with you back in the day. Um, yeah. Let the uh, or give the audience something about yourself. Tell us about your career uh, as a player and as a coach. Cheers, Lee. It's great to speak to you, mate. Thanks for the, hey, thanks for the introduction as well. Um, so I don't know how long you've got about, you know, my, my playing days and my coaching days back home. I mean, I, I, from it, being a small boy, I can remember I hey, like growing up in England for all of us, uh, wanting to be a professional soccer player from you know, probably being 10, 11 years old. And, um, you know, playing for the school team, playing for local teams. I was lucky enough to go and play for um, Sheffield United as a young pro, as a young apprentice and a young pro. Um, I had... Uh, 15 years in the game, so as a pro, so I played around 400 league appearances in England. And then after finishing playing uh, as a professional, uh, I decided to get into the coaching side. So I went through the FA and got through my um, coaching badges, um, coaching qualifications, finished up doing my UEFA A licence about three or four years ago now. Um, while I was doing that, I was working at a pro club in England called PDB United. Um, who are renowned for kind of producing young, talented players. And um, then I was there for probably three or four years at Peterborough. And um, I had a phone call from uh, an ex-colleague of mine uh, who was out here in Southern California, who runs this club, Marietta Surf, that I work at now, and asked me to come across. So um, here I am. And I'd, like you said, I run the boys, I'm the boys director uh, at the club. And uh, I love it, love it every minute. Nice. So is the weather a little bit better over there than it is back in England? Uh, you could say that, Lee. You could. <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been great, to be fair. It's not still not become um, like um, a regular kind of... I'll look every day and think, I'll look out the side and think, God, it's beautiful. what a beautiful day, <laughs> which obviously you can't say back in yeah. England. No, you, wait, you know. wait for the raindrops, you check the curtain. Oh, it's grey outside, best get my coat on. <laughs> That's funny, Matt. That's funny. Love it. So, uh, Matt, you mentioned that you played over 400 professional games. Um, is there a game that stands out for you that you will always remember? Hey, you know what? That's a good question. It's a tough one, though, because, you know, there's been so many games that I've played in that, you know, I remember for different reasons. Um, I suppose that, you know, if anyone, you know, if you're asking that question, the big ones that stand out are probably the big teams that I played against, look, are lucky enough to play against Man City um, wow. in the, one of the final league games of the season for the club I was at. Um, I was at uh, Hull City and we played uh, against Man City in one of the final league games. And uh, I remember it being a full house at, at the old ground, actually, on the Etihad. It was Main Road, Main United, uh, Man City's old ground. And uh, it's just a, a great game. We had a great game. We played, we played really well. Uh, the team played really well. And then in the last 10 minutes, we conceded two late goals and we lost the game 4-2. And it, it just the fortunes of both clubs. So that took Man City into the automatic playoffs and they went up from the league in, into, the, um, into the playoffs. And we actually got relegated in the last 10 minutes of the season. So it was a great game. I remember it for being a great game, but obviously bittersweet in the end. Yeah. Also, I've been lucky enough to play against Man United a few times. So, Love it. Um, so you know, the, the old players that some of your young boys might recognise, like Beckham and uh, Roy Keane, Skulls and Giggs. You know, I remember the game thinking, these boys, th these players were just a different level. Yeah. And um, remember them games really well. Um, there's another game we played in the FA Cup against Crystal Palace. The, uh, where we beat Crystal Palace and uh, late on in the game, which took us through to the next round. We played away at Sellers Park and we were lower league team at the time. And uh, so we'd gone on to play like a Premier League team and we'd gone and be yeah, beat them at Palace. And, you know, so great memory. I've got some great memories. Good and bad, but there's been yeah, some. So there's not one that stands out. There's a, there's a handful which uh, you, I hear your name dropping a few of them clubs, Man City, Man United. That's just... 
that's just a dream for a lot of players to think as a young boy, even as a young adult, wow, I'd love to play against those guys. And you were, you were lucky enough not to play against one of those teams, but both of them teams, which um, yeah. for, for me, growing up, David Beckham was my idol. I wore my hair like his, I, I bleached my hair like his. I, I found my love for the Spice Girls. I don't know if I should say that on here, but I found my love for the Spice Girls. I wanted the Adidas <laughs> Predators. Yeah. Um, and you are so lucky to have played alongside him. Was there anything in that game that you, apart from <clears throat> David Beckham and, oh my God, there's, there's oh. the actual God of the world. Did anything stand out to you from Bex that um, maybe stood out from any other player? I think so. I think, you know, when you play against these top teams, you recognise there is a difference. You know, mainly most, you know, I was going to go on to say that in my career, I started off, obviously, like I said, at Sheffield United, yeah. where at the time, Sheffield United were in the Premier League at the time as well. And so I was lucky enough to see some top players. And then as I went on in my career, I played um, in the league below, in the now Championship and then League One. and league. So I've been through a lot of the leagues uh, in my career, which I think has give, given me kind of a, um, a great view on standards and actually being a coach now, looking at what makes a difference between playing at a lower level and playing at the top level. You know, I remember about people like Beckham, and I mentioned Giggs, and I don't know if people remember here, Roy Keane. And play. I just remember the, 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 just the, our, the quality they had. And, you know, just as, a, just, just as an instance, I remember in the Man United game, um, actually Beckham uh, it was obviously a right winger at the time, he dropped back to go and receive a ball off the goalkeeper. So he dropped really deep to receive the ball just outside the 18-yard box, probably in the right back spot, in the outside back spot. And he got his head up and he looked at Giggs, who was probably 70 yards away on the left wing. And he's absolutely pinged the ball 70 yards. Yeah. And everyone's just watched and he's gone drilled in. He's gone right to Giggs' chest. And everyone just stood and just started clapping because it was just the technique of the, of the guy and the yeah. quality of the players was just a, a different level. Yeah. That's amazing. That probably leads into our next question I was going to ask you. So, um, yeah. what, what do you feel that it takes to uh, be a pro and be an established pro, a young pro or, or a pro to be? What, what do you think it takes, Matt? What, you know, something that probably stands out, what, what do you reckon it takes? Well, I think it's probably, you know, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, we can come up with some probably buzzwords about yeah. um, desire and attitude, which is a big one for me. Uh, the care, your care you have and your technical ability and your tactical awareness. And we can talk about all the buzzwords, which is great. But I think um, I can only speak from experience of myself and some of the players I've worked with. And I think there's, a, um, there's you know, there's, there's a love of what you want to do. I've always had a burning desire. And you know me as a personally, um, as, you know, as one of my friends that I'm quite a, growing up, I was quite a shy um quite a shy person didn't say a lot but I always had this burning desire yeah. to be a pro I can remember from being such a young kid knowing that I was going to be a pro footballer or a pro soccer player and uh, in, in fact I remember um, at school so as you know Lee back at school in England you have like a careers lady that comes yeah. around to the school as you get older yeah. and actually remember being I'd be about 14 15 years old at kind of secondary school in England and uh, get pulled out of the classroom. Matt, you need to go and see the careers lady in the other room. So I remember, I can see it now. I walked in the, in the, in the door and I sat down and the careers lady said to me, so, um, so young man, what are you going to do when you're older? What would you like to do? And I, I remember saying, I'm, I'm going to be a, a professional, professional footballer. And she looked at me and she kind of had a smile on her face. I, I can see her now. And I said, and she said, no, but seriously, as a career, what, what would you like to do seriously when you, when you leave the school? I went, no, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm, I'm going to be a professional footballer. Yeah. And she said, yeah, but as a backup, and I'm not advising this, by the way, because <laughs> I, I didn't really, in my, in my head, I never had a backup. And, um, but I was so determined. I was so yeah. kind of driven to want to wanna be a professional soccer player. I was, there was no other thing for me. Yeah. And I think that I had this burning desire um, I was out in my back garden every single night. And I say this to the players I coach now. I said, my, a lot of my learning obviously came from my coaches like ourselves, Lee. But a lot of my learning came from um, just being in my back garden. Mm -hmm. And having my mate, actually, I was lucky enough to have a friend who lived next door to me who was a similar age. And we used to play every night. Yeah. Every night in the back garden, we used to do 1v1s. 
We used to do chipping the ball, bending the ball, driving the ball, penalties, free kick. We used to do, we used to do everything. And in fact, to, you know, it's like back home. It gets back, it gets dark probably about 10 p.m. in the summer. Yeah. About 10 That's o'clock. Right. My mum used to have to drag us in. Yeah. Get, it used to be getting dark and my mum was going, you need to come in now, Matt. <laughs> I remember going, nah, five more minutes. And she had to use it. Most nights she used to have to drag me and my mate in yeah. because we were out there all night. Yeah, and I think, no. I think that's, you know, I look back now, Lee, and being an, obviously a coach, and I look back to my to them days, I think, you know, I've learned so much from the coaches I had, but also I've always had this burning desire. I've always had this passion mm. and drive and this hunger to want to be better. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, just to, you know, just to add on to that as well, I think there's, um, th- there's a lot of things on the way to, to the route of being a footballer of you know of setbacks yeah. and um you know we all we all get it and i'm not just saying that pros get it you know we we all get it on the way so you'll always be told by coaches or by certain people you're not good enough i had that i got told when i was 12 years old that i was never going to be a professional soccer player yeah. by a guy who ran our kind of state our county's soccer he'd come up to me and went you're a good player but you're never going to be a professional because you're not big enough and you're not good enough and at the time, I was upset, but I can remember thinking, I'm going to show you. That yeah. was my attitude at the time. Without, no, without consciously wanting to be like, I was like, right, let's, I'm, I'm going to prove to you I'm going to be. That's brilliant. And I think, you know, to have that resilience, you need that. Yeah. You, you need that as a player. That's amazing, Matt. That really is. It's great to hear. Uh, I mean, you, you're a very talented man. And as I said, I had the honour to play with you. And I learned a lot from yourself. Your experience was second to none, um, which... Is is always great to hear, and I love these stories that you're that you're giving us. Um, how old were you when you got scouted by a pro academy? Lee, I was probably about. I'd, I'd say I, I probably started playing when I when I was about ten. I'd say nine or ten. So probably later compared to some of the kids these days, because I know at our club where we are, with the started probably four or five years old. So started at about ten, and played like like I said, played locally. And then scouts, as we have back home, probably started recognising me when I was about 12, 13 years old. Um, and there's a few scouts locally where we lived um, that, that represented a few good clubs. I know, I remember I went to Leicester City as a young player uh, for a tryout there. I went to Norwich. I went to Nottingham Forest. I can remember going to Leeds United. I spent a bit of time at Leeds United. I loved, loved that club. And then, but obviously, like I said, I ended up at Sheffield United as a 14-year-old. Um, at Sheffield United and the difference for me was was the coaches to be fair at the club it was a great club uh, but it was just a family and in fact when you walk to Sheffield United and you walk in the main car park and you look at the stand now it's actually got the family club and it's it's kind of like um, renowned and they that's part of their kind of brand is Sheffield United the family club and it was you know from from the first team manager who made a fuss of all the young players. He remembered all the, all the young players' names. He knew me, he knew my father, he knew my mother. And I think that made the difference where the coaches really showed an active interest in, you know, not just me as a player, but me as a person. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So when, when you were of that age, when you got scattered by that club, what do you think made you stand out from the rest of the, the, rest of the boys at your level that, Obviously, as you said, England's full of young lads that want to be pros. They, they, exactly. they have that desire, they have that drive that they want to be pros. But what do you think made the, the coaches see, oh, there's, there's that young young lad, young whippersnapper, Matt Ockian, with a blonde hair. Yeah, at the time, yeah. What, what do, <laughs> no, what, 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 great now, Lee. <laughs> what, do you reckon, what do you reckon they saw in you as a, as a young player to, to make them think, yeah, he's got that? I think it's a good question and it's a, it's something that actually I try and teach my players about attributes. I knew at the time what my main attributes were. I think for me, I knew that I was quick and had real great pace. And if someone asked me now, what was your main asset? I'll say it's my pace. I was, I was really, really quick. And so I knew how to use that kind of thing. I used to, and I was a winger at the time. I played on the wing. I played down the flanks. I played as an outside back as well. And I used to just use my pace. And so people used to, you know, I'll say to my players now, Lee, and to advice to give them before games, I'll, I'll tell them that your main attributes, you need to show them. Mm. So if you're really good in the air and good at winning headers and really aggressive, you need to go and do that. You need to go and win everything. Because if you don't do, do that, then there's no point you being on the field. 
you know, if you're a good passer and you're great on the ball, like a like an Iniesta or Xavi or someone who's fantastic technically, then you need to you need to get on the ball. Yeah. You need to show people how good you are on the ball. Like for me, with my pace, I just knew every game that I had to go and show and go and beat people with my pace or recovery runs, show people how quick I was because that would stand out. Yeah. I think that you know other things take you know help to be a pro. So you need to be technically good. You need to be ta- tactically aware. Like I said, you need kind of a, you need some kind of aggression to and have that winning mentality. And that all comes. But I think if you're aware of what your strengths are, and then it helps you as a player because then you know that what you need to use during a game. You know yeah, what what kind of things it makes you stand out. You know, and then then obviously it's, it's important to recognise your weakness as well. So you can work on your weaknesses. And then you can also make them one of your strengths. And I mean, like I said, when I was younger, Lee, I was quite shy and a quiet player. So I remember my, when I was an under 18, in fact, my, my coach at Sheffield United said to me, Matt, you need to show some more leadership qualities. And so I used to think, your leadership qualities, that's talking more, communicating more. And I used to think to me, oh, what does that, what do I say? What do I, what do I say during the game? And they're just getting used to coming out of my comfort zone. Yeah. and organising people around me. And the coach, he helped me with buzzwords and, you know, t- talking to players, telling them we've got a man on or, you know, yeah. turn or all these different different things. But, That's you know, recognising what you need to work on as well. That's great. That's great, Matt. You, you touched on that because um, we, within Monmouth United, did a, uh, a player identity not so long ago. Um, I ran a yeah. session on mental development player identity, knowing your strengths, making those strengths your superior strengths, not just having that, like you say, your, your pace or your passing ability, like make that passing ability, instead of making 10 passes a game, how can you make 20 passes a game? Work on your left foot, your right foot, your short passes, your long passes. All those where that strength's going to be somewhat just natural. You see a pass, you do it. Um, yeah. And also identify your weaker areas where you work on your weaker areas and before you know it, they become one of your strengths as well. Um, so it's great that you touched on that. That's really, that's really good. And I'm hoping that you players that participated in that mental session, you've just seen and heard from an ex-pro straight from his mouth why we've just touched on that subject. Um, but Hox, you've coached some of the, the most talented players in England and America on, on the West Coast. Um, yeah. What, yeah. what makes them players stand out to you? Um, Hey, Lee, it's all if different things. I think that um, I think first of all for me um, is an attitude. Yeah. Hey, we've all heard it before, but it's an attitude. I don't think there's not many players that I've coached or I've seen that have made it or seen that have like, kind of moved to higher levels without a good attitude to want to learn and to want to work. You know, and you know, I'm going to go back to um, my playing days of obviously. I started off playing at Sheffield United and the play at the t- one of the higher levels, and then I've, like I said, I've played through all the levels uh, or most of the levels back home, even to the fact where I played non-league and lower league uh, soccer back in England. And actually, it's a lesson I have to teach my boys at this club here where I am because um, I remember being at um, Sheffield United and I met a lot of top people, a lot of good players, and I recognised that not all the players that played at this top level were hugely talented. The, the, not all of them are. You know, I've got, I've got a good friend that played in the Premiership for five years, I speak to, and he'll tell you himself that technically, he was absolutely bang average. Physically, physically, he was a big, big, big boy, and he was quick, yeah. okay? And he knew his strengths. Uh, but his attitude was like, it was, he, I'm going to work harder than anyone else here. And I think he played five years in the Prem, and if you look at look at it, you look back at his uh, attributes. You look and go, talent technically, it was it was absolutely bang average. Yeah. And you know, you look and think tactically, it was okay, but he was attitude and his desire and work, and that goes for a lot of people I met at playing at the top level. They were just a different animal mentally, mm. that they just wanted to do more, work harder than anyone else, yeah. be in the gym first. But I mean, luckily enough, uh, my my boss who I work with at the moment. He worked at LA Galaxy and uh, knew David Beckham when he worked there. And he tells our boys a story that Beckham was in every day earlier than anyone else. And a lot of people have heard this probably story before when he was at Man United. But he was there with the coaches at 8 a.m. in the morning or 7 a.m. when the coaches come. He was there before the rest of the players. 
And then he would be in the gym, he'd be on the treadmill, he would work hard, he'd have a sweat on. And then when the players came to training, he would obviously work and do the training session. And when the training session finished, he would stay out extra and he'd work on his free kicks, he'd work on his passing, he'd work on his... And then he would be the last one to leave. Yeah. And that's, I think that says a lot about the character of, of the man or players that make it. But I was just going on to say, Lee, playing lower level for me as well, I played lower level with some really talented players, actually non-league soccer back in England, uh, where you don't get obviously paid a lot of money for playing non-league soccer. And I played with some players that I've looked and gone, wow, what talent these players have got. And you look and go, technically, these, some of these players are fantastic. And I think, how has he not, never played in the, in the football league? How has he never been a pro? Yeah. And then you see over time the attitude of the player and you see his desire and his work rate and he's late for training. And he done, he's ill when he's not ill and he misses games because he'd rather be out with his mates. And then you realise, ah, that's why. That's the difference. Yeah. And that's it for me. Yeah. It's it. it that very cliche of uh, hard work beats talent. Um, and as simple as that may seem, that's obviously shown it's a, it's a key area in the success. Um, like you said, top players, players in the game that they admittedly say that themselves they're technically bang average, but what drives mm. through is their hard work, right? You, you told the story about Beckham, you hear it about Ronaldo. Players try to beat Ronaldo to practice, and he's always there. Whatever time they're there, he's there, he's there before yeah. them. They try and leave later, he's going to be. Five ten minutes later than them, which um, that that proves that that hard work, that attitude, that professionalism does go a long way to get you to that next step to outshine. Um, whether it's at tryouts within your game, whether you're trying to make it yeah. to the high school level, college, pro, whatever. The the main thing from what you said there, Matt, from your experience is that um, hard work and that attitude gets you very very far within the. It, the soccer, game. soccer game I guess within with everything if you go for a job interview and yeah. you've got you're great for instance at, on computers if you're just going to be lazy in your interview rather than show the professionalism your attitude your desire you're not going to get the interviews so it, it's it's good to hear that um that, that that is something that everybody's in control of you're you control how hard you work if you yeah. want to if you want to work an extra five minutes, if you want to go to the field and, and smash free kicks in for 10 minutes, you, it's, it's down to you, nobody else. Yeah. Um, so that's great, mate. So I think, they, sorry, I think as a coach, we noticed that. I mean, yeah, I noticed with my players, the ones, as soon as I get them in to talk to them, I notice the ones that listen, the ones that aren't really paying attention, the ones, and I could name them all, I could go through my squad, if, if the two teams I've got at the moment, and I could go, good attitude, needs to learn, got to lot to, <laughs> lot to and I could go through it. That's not even thinking about the talent. Mm, but yeah. then, you know, it, it, it's got a, some, with some of them, so I've got some real talented players that I coach here. But, you know, I think they've got to switch on. They've got to make sure their attitude is good as well because if it's not, they've got no chance. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So leading on into the next question, mate, you uh, yeah. mentioned the clubs that you coach now. Uh, we touched briefly on it earlier, the Marietta Surf on the West Coast. Give us some info on that. Tell us about that club that you're in right now. Well, uh, we're literally, um, Mietta Surf is obviously an affiliate of, of, maybe a lot of people have heard of San Diego Surf, which is a big club out here in California. So we were actually the first affiliate of um, San Diego Surf. Um, we're probably an hour, 45 minutes to an hour north of San Diego, and maybe an hour, hour and a half south of LA. So we're somewhere in the middle, and um, just inland in, the, in, in the, the county of Riverside. So good club. Um, obviously, we've got um, some top teams in the club. Um, we've got we've just been issued, as you, as you mentioned, uh, MLS status for the youth league this year. So previously DA, and now obviously the MLS have taken that over. So um, that, that's great news for the, the players of the club. Um, we I think we have around about fifty teams in the club league where we work this at this club, boys and girls from the ages of under eight to under seven, under eight, to under 18s, under 19s, boys and girls. Um, we've got a lot of good coaches and actually coaches that have been through all different walks of kind of coaching in the game. So we've got, like I say, got a few, a couple of ex-pros here. Um, our girls director um, coached in the Premier League in the English game for the women's, we're on the women's side. He actually won the FA Cup uh, with Birmingham City. 
know, like my boss, he obviously, um, he, he was a coach with Stevie Nicol at New England Revolution. Uh, we've got coaches here that work at colleges and high schools and have been, been through that kind of system. So we've got a lot of experience, a lot of good talent. You know, it, it is renowned. I know that it's great on the East Coast as well, but where we are is like a bit of a hotbed as well for talent um, in California. So um, it's an exciting, you know, it's an exciting club. Things are moving forward. I know we've got some, you know, big things ahead. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, a couple of changes with the DAs, the MLS. Um, yeah, that's right. So you, you've got, it sounds to me that you've got a, a, a range of uh, level of teams there. You've got your DAs, your, your MLS teams, should we say now, um, yeah. that, that, that borderline pro youth academy is. If we relate to England, you're, 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 you're nearly there, you're... You're looking and you're driving on to make that pro football career, a pro soccer career, should we say? Yeah. Uh, so, what what are you boys been doing in Marietta Surf? What have you been doing in this craziness? Uh, I mean, I, I know it's gone virtual and it's a different way. And right, yeah, you, yeah. what kind what kind of things have you guys been doing to hit all those areas that you want to cover to make sure the boys and girls um, yeah, yeah. are staying relevant to soccer throughout this time? Well, to, to be honest, Lee, I, we had a chat, I know we had a chat a couple of weeks ago about what we've been doing over there at your club. And I think it's pretty similar to what we've been doing here at our club. You know, it's tough because obviously I've got two children myself and they're climbing the walls. They want to be outside playing sport and, you know, it's, um, it, it's tough. And all my players that I speak to, we have Zoom meetings like I know you do, Lee. And the question I get all the time is, coach, when, when, when are we going to be out on the field? I'm like, listen, be patient hopefully soon yeah you know and uh but all they want to ask me is when we're going to be out so i know it's been tough we've been doing lots of virtual sessions live sessions um, on zoom uh, every night a different coach from the club goes on our instagram channel and does a live session of, at 5 p.m over here and does a 45 minute it may be ball ball work it may be technical stuff it may be a um, a tactical session it may be a, a, a physical session when you're working hard so we've been doing things like that um, I know that a lot of coaches our older coaches have been working with our boys and girls and talking to them about the relevance of college and about videos and how to put together a video for college stuff okay. what's relevant to them I know some of our younger teams our U8s U9s U10s have been working and we've said it's a great opportunity even though it's not an ideal situation we're in it's been a great opportunity for our players to work on all the things that like we spoke earlier need to work on. So all the technical stuff, all the things, ball, ball mastery for yeah. young players is so important to be comfortable with the ball. Yeah. So I know we've got a program for our youngers uh, to put them through like a ball mastery and kind of a, a ball manipulation sessions, which has gone down really well. That's great. That's uh, great. So I, yeah. I've been calling this self season. Um, you don't have to think about anything. You don't have to think about in training, your 1v1s, overloading, getting numbers up, blah, 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 spreading the field, creating blah. Yeah. Self-season. You're working on yourself. You're working on your touch. You, like you say, ball manipulation, ball mastery, uh, ball mastery foot yeah. skills, um, first touch, aerial control, this and it, that you can all do on yourself. So for me, yeah. I've been calling it self-season, which... Um, it's really gone down a storm. For me, you're never going to get this time again. So we've got to use it wisely. Um, our players have been phenomenal by sending videos in. Um, yeah. And it shows, uh, I think, throughout uh, speaking to people back home at professional youth clubs and yourself on the West Coast, um, teach, working with the MLS, club, uh, MLS team and stuff, that mm. everybody's been doing the same thing. And, and it really is important that, this self season is taken serious. You know, you get distracted that you're not on the field. Um, it is upsetting. It is annoying. It does get, it, it does get your spirits down, but yeah. self season, it, it's, it, I think it links it back to in everything you've said, Matt, with your drive to become better. How much do you want to become better? And right now this is your perfect time to become better by working on yourself. Um, so that, that's good to hear that, we're sticking through it all as coaches. We're all on the same wavelength and we're, we're making the best of a bad situation as such. Um, yeah, there's lots of players could do with Lee. I mean, I've, I've actually said to my players, well, there's books you can read. Not that everyone wants to read a book about, about players or, but there's also, um, you know, like we, when we was younger back home, you know, we'd, 
I would be one way. I'd, I'd watch a video of a place to buy the old VHS cassette tapes. Uh, <laughs> but I'd be, obviously you can see it now on, on the Netflix and Amazon and stuff. But players, and I used to watch the players play and I used to try and go outside on the field or the grass on my back garden and emulate, emulate what, what I'd seen on the TV. Hmm. So like every young boy back home, we used to go and watch the FA Cup final. Yeah. And then at half time, I just get the goals. <laughs> go and replicate the goals in my back garden with my mate. Love hey, it. Get a, Love it. Well, well, that's what it's all about. I think yeah. it's about having that imagination to want to replicate what you know your idol or your best, you know, yeah. your, your favorite players. And I that's think it's, it's a great opportunity to do it. That's amazing, mate. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it's, it's funny that you should say that. I've scored no end of FA Cup winning goals. It's <laughs> I'm running off, screaming around the field, only to realise that I'm running through my mum's daisies and she's fuming with me that I've just got <laughs> a flower bed up. So, Hawks, um, we all work with parent coaches. Um, this I know yep. we've got parent coaches watching, um, as well as players and parents themselves. But what would your advice be to parent coaches to get the best out of their players? Um, I know that they, some parent coaches are, are unable to sta uh, stand and watch sessions when we do the team sessions. Um, yeah. but some are lucky enough to see us do that and how we work and trigger words we use and whatever. But what, what would you give or what advice would you give your parent coaches? That's a great question. Um, it's a tough one, Lee. I, I think that... <laughs> Without you know, upsetting anybody, Matt. <laughs> no, no. It, 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 it's a tough one because... Going back again to my experience, I had a father that was very, you know, very encouraging. My parents are very encouraging and lovely and parents. I may add, met them, had the honour of meeting them. Lovely parents. You no, know, did everything for me, Lee. You know, my, my dad still, my parents still still speak to them, and they come across and see see me and so. And they did. Look, my, my parents were very encouraging. Um, they were harsh at times uh, when they didn't think I was I was probably working hard enough, or they thought, but. You know, I think it's important to be encouraging. I think the biggest thing for me um, with the parents is to be encouraging and making sure you don't over... I see a lot of parents here. Let me give you an example. So I see a lot of parents here. And I don't know if it's where we are or it's like a culture where we are across on the, on the West Coast or, or it's everywhere. But there's a lot of um, harsh words, shall we say, on the field. And I see kids' reactions sometimes, not just from the parents, it's from the coaches and from, and I look and think, you know, as an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old boy, I know what I was like when I used to, when I used, someone used to shout and scream and bawl at me, I, it had a negative effect. And, it, and it, it really, I think it's got, you've got to try and keep it encouraging. I think you've got to try in the car journey on the way home from games or training, to not actively judge too much and say, well, that one good enough. Why didn't you score? Why didn't you keep the ball? Why didn't you pop pass? I think, you know, everyone's trying to do the best. And I think you just ask the question of how did you play? Mm. You know, how do you feel like you did? What do you think you could have done better? You know, what would you do next time? Why don't you speak to your coach and see if your coach would, you know, would give you some advice? You know, I know you said to me earlier, Lee, you, you get players wanting to come up to you and say, what can I work on coach? I think that's what every coach wants. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what can I work on, and I think for the parents, it's to understand that you know people like yourself, Lee, who've been in the game back home and uh, been through a lot of, you know, a lot of experience, a lot of good, you know, a lot, of, a lot of good coaches have worked with you. You've coached a lot of good kids as well, Lee. It's important that you know they take note of what you're saying. The kids, you know, listen to what advice you get, you give. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's trying to keep things positive for me. Try and keep things positive and learning in a positive environment. And I think it's a big thing that we've tried to do at this club where we're at here, Lee at Marietta Surf, where the kids can come in and be in an environment where they feel like they can make mistakes. Yeah. So yeah. they don't come in and think, if I make a mistake today, my dad's going to shout at me and my coach is going to scream at me. Yeah. And then at the weekend, I'm not going to play because we don't have that. No. We don't have, the parents don't get involved, obviously. And we are very much encouraging and trying to say to the kids, you know, what if they make a mistake, what, what could you have done better? Why did you make that? Why did you choose that decision? Why did you not, uh, you know, try and keep positive? So when they come into training, they're like, they're buzzing to come in yeah. and they can't wait to come into training. They're not worrying. You know, I've seen it in the past and I've seen this back in England, Lee, at pro clubs where you get a coach that's a little bit harsh, which hey, it all has, has its benefits. But you see the kids come in and it's like Sergeant Major. Yeah. And, for me, and for me, the style of I coach, the way I coach, I personally, I don't think that's beneficial for young players. 
I think they need to be allowed to express themselves. They need to be allowed to go and show and make mistakes and learn from the mistakes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's definitely. I had, just to, sorry, just to finish off, I actually, before I came across uh, to the US uh, a few years ago, three years ago now, um, I was on a course with the FA, the English FA, and uh, it's about actually youth players and how to speak to youth players, young players. And the example was that the tutor gave us that if you came in at half time as a coach and your full back or your outside back is getting beat by the winger, he's get every time he or she's getting beat, the winger's doing him every time, getting crosses in the box. What would you say to your player? And so it was like, you know, we need to tend to go, you know, but um, to get tighter, we need to tend to. But he said, as an FA, as an English FA, we want your kids to learn. So they need to learn by their mistakes. So instead of taking him off or her off or telling him what or her to do, we want you to keep him on the field and say to the player, all you need to say is, how could you make it more difficult for that player to beat you? What could you do in the second half to make it more difficult for that winger to beat you? What do you need to do? And leave it and yeah. let them work it out for themselves. And then Maybe, if they yeah. And then if they can't work it out for themselves, you might need to give them prompts or advice or maybe if you did this, what would happen? But I think far too often we're, we're keen to jump on players sometimes and say, right, well, off, get yourself off and get someone on because uh, that players don't learn that way. No, that's right. No, the, uh, I, I call it discovery. Um, you dis, you right. discover, it's not a mistake. It, you discover it's a discovery. You, that's like, correct. Beat, it's good. Beat me on the left side or beat me on the right side. This time, body pushing, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's not, oh my God, I did this wrong. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get subbed any minute. You know, yeah. so I think what you say now with like the relaxed environment, not sergeant major, um, the, the guided way to discovery as such to get that success from those situations that the kids are facing or the players are facing that are finding difficulty from that um, comes all as a package. Your yeah. relaxed environment, give them like trigger words as such. Yeah, um, I, I'm a keen coach on working on triggers um, to make kids react to those scenarios rather than giving them a paragraph to think, oh, coach, this, 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 this. They think, right, trigger word or trigger movement, and we react to that. Yeah. Um, but, we, Matt, we, moving on, uh, we are... Uh, we want to win as well, Lee. Sorry, we want to win as well. So I know there's a balance between, you know, the development and the winning. So... Yeah, we all want to, but I do think that it, it can come hand in hand. For me, as a person, as a coach, I feel like the development and, like you say, the guided discovery stuff you give players and the winning can come hand in hand. It can, you can't, don't have to have one or the other for me. I think you can have development and winning at the same time. Yeah, so, um, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, sorry, man. I know we, we could talk for hours and hours and hours, um, but I, we are limited down to time. So we're on to our last question that I've got for you. Um, to, to keep it short and sweet, um, you've obviously had a great, successful pro career. Um, you're an amazing coach, an amazing person. But what can you, um, what advice can you give players that, that those players that want to be pro, that want to make high school varsity, or want to play college, or that want to make a club team, or that want to be captain on the travel team? What advice can you give them if we can keep it short and sweet? Okay. I, what yeah. what would you say if if you come up to me, or if I came up to you, Matt, and said, "Right, Matt, uh, I want to I want to be club captain this year. What can, yeah. what can I do to achieve that?" Lee, I think it comes down to attitude and hard work. I, I don't like coming out with cliches, but I think the hard work and the attitude to to, to that desire to want to go and do that and doing more than everyone else. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Things like things like being a pro or being a top player in college and being a top player or making the MLS or whatever the young kids want to achieve in, in their career, it just doesn't happen. It, it, you know, there's got to be, there's got to be hard work and all that comes with it. I think I asked a similar question to an ex-pro myself a few weeks ago and he came up with something great, which is, I think I'll, I'll pass it on. It's care. Mm. He said, he, he, he coached in the MLS. He coached um, a top MLS team. And he said, I'd know a player straight away that if they cared or not. He said, if they worked hard in training when they were losing, if they worked hard in the gym, if they, I, I, they're the players I went for. Because I asked him what, he, what would he look for in a player, in a young player, he went, care. He said, they could be the most talented first player in the, in the world. He said, but I want someone that cares, that has that desire to want to be better 
and want to work. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing, Matt. That's great to hear from top of the top, uh, what you've experienced through your career, that you've experienced as a coach, you, you, you know what you want. And it, it's such a great feeling. And it's so refreshing to hear from, as I said, one of the top dogs of the game yourself, that that hard work. And again, within our mental sessions um, that we've been doing at Monmouth County, one of the coaches touched on controllables and uncontrollables. Yeah. Um, and, and that thing that can get you to the next level is totally controllable. It's down to you. Um, you, you, get your, you get there 10 minutes early. Are you doing juggles on the side of the field while the coach is getting ready? Are you practicing your foot skills? Are you practicing your air control? Are you spending 15 minutes at the weekend after you game banging balls in the goal? Or are you there on the field with your sibling or whatever, working on your first touch, this, that and the other? And um, I think it, it takes all sorts to make it, you know, everyone wants to be the next Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo. But not many people want to be the next Jose Eltidor, let's for example. Right, but, yeah. you know, but Jose Eltidor, he knew what his strengths were. And he's made a great living in the game at the top, very, very top level in international soccer. Mm-hmm. And But kids want to be the look at the Messi's and, and, and the obviously the Ronaldo's of the world. But it takes all sorts. So just because maybe you're not ever going to be technically as gifted as Ronaldo and Messi doesn't mean that you're not going to make it as a pro because you've got these different attributes, you know, like we said earlier. So I think if you, you, know, you work hard on the things you've got given and you recognise what they are and you work on your weaknesses, hey, there's an opportunity for every kid. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, Matt, that's, uh, it's been a, a great, however long it's been, I can't see, uh, probably 40 minutes now. But no, we, as, as, I've, as, I've mentioned, as I've mentioned before, we could go on for hours and hours and hours. It's amazing speaking to you, um, your career that you've had as a player, your current career now as a coach on the West Coast. It's amazing to hear from a, a successful ex-pro, from a successful coach that um, a lot of these things that we've been discussing to players, to parents, to our clubs that have been outlined by yourself and, and backed up kind of thing throughout your careers, experiences, that we appreciate your time massively. Um, Anytime, Lee. No, I, I can't, I can't, I can't I thank you time. enough, mate. I can't thank you enough, mate. It's been brilliant talking to you. Uh, is we appreciate your advice that you've given myself, that you've given the people watching. Um, and, and as I said, mate, I hope that you and your family stay safe and well through this, and and the club gets back up and running, back on the field. And you, I wish you all the best and all the success for your next season, whenever that may be. Exactly. Yeah. Cheers, Lee. Thank you. I really appreciate it, mate. Great to, uh, great to speak to you again this morning. And the uh, same for you. Good luck to you all. You, you, you and the players, your players for the rest of the season. And uh, hey, we all hope this, this gets ended quickly, the situation we're in, and we can get it back out in the field. Absolutely, mate. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll speak to you again soon. Stay safe. Thank you. Cheers, Lee. Thanks.